Hi everybody, welcome back to the Feynman Technique. This is a video that has been a long time coming on this channel. This is going to be a proof of the general Leibniz rule for differentiation under the integral sign. Um, the uh, As opposed to the one we're used to using on this channel where our bounds of integration are constants. The general uh, Leibniz rule um, you can you can actually have uh, functions of your parameter as bounds of integration and I'll show you what I mean. Let's just get started though. So first a few things. We're going to let f of t be defined as uh, this integral right here and you can see it's going to be a function of t because if we evaluate if we integrate a function of x and t with respect to x and then plug in functions of t for all our in place of all our x values we're going to get a uh, a function that is is solely dependent on t okay so now we're going to use the limit definition of a derivative that's stated right here if we plug our function of t in to the limit definition of the derivative um, this is what we end up with, because this was our original function of t, and this is our function of t with uh, plus h um, added to all the t's. So you see that that, that is f prime of t expressed as a limit and integrals. Okay. So next, what we're going to do is we're just going to do a little trick here. We're going to add and subtract the same thing inside the numerator. Um, and by the way, guys, I'm uh, this is a direct copy of the um, <clears throat> of the chapter on the proof in my book. Um, so th that's where this comes from. All right. So we're going to add and subtract this integral, um, and then we'll, we'll do some regrouping just going to uh, add and subtract this integral from the numerator and then regroup it. All right. <clears throat> so next, we will use this property of integrals. It just says that you, if the integral from some value c1 to c4 is equal to these three integrals, one going from c1 to c2, then c2 to c3, then c3 to c4, and you could continue that um, indefinitely this could go from c1 to c a, a billion and then so on and so on as long as it went from one to the other and then eventually to a billion um okay and we're going to use that to rewrite this integral right here so um we break this up into three integrals uh the first one starts with our original lower bound and then it goes to a of t and then it goes from a of t to b of t, and then finally from b of t to our original upper bound. All right. And then we'll substitute that back in, and there will be some uh, a cancellation. You can see that um, if we replace this, b, this integral right here with these three integrals, um, you'll see we have a uh, plus a of t to b of t of this minus that exact same thing. Um, and what you end up with after the cancellations is this. All right, and then we're going to kind of regroup it. Um, we're going to, um, I'm just, I just rearrange, I, I just rearrange stuff a little bit, that's all. Basically, I switch this and this. And then we use this property of integrals. You can say that the integral from c1 to c2 is negative integral c2 to c1. So we're going to rewrite this integral, which is right here, as the negative of itself with the bound switched. That's all. All right, and then we can rewrite our f prime of t like this. Now we have a nice grouping here. This is going to be helpful. All right, and now we can actually split, we can split the limit. We're just going to say that this is the limit of, of this plus the limit of this. All I did is I just chopped off this part and put it to the side. Okay. 
So for the second term, that's right here. Since a and t and b of t are constants with respect to x, we can bring that limit inside uh, the integral. And that assumes um, some appropriate continuity conditions, which I won't get into here. You'll, you'll very rarely find um, uh, conditions when you would not be able to do that. Um, and I'll explain a little bit that, uh, about that at the end of the video. Okay, so now we have this. Notice that um, this limit we bring inside, and now we just have the limit definition of a partial derivative of a function of x and t with respect to t. So we rewrite it like that. That's the integral from a of t to b of t of the partial with respect to t of x and t. And a lot of you are familiar with, um, with that part right there. Okay, so next, let's say that, let's notice that for small intervals on b of t, for the small interval b of t to b of t plus h, that's going to be a very small interval right here, we're talking about this right here, and a of t to a of t plus h. Um, and remember that in the end, our h is going to zero. So this is going to be an incredibly small interval. And we're going to use the uh, mean value theorem for integrals, which states that if some function is continuous on a, on the closed interval a, b, then there exists some value c on that interval, such that the value of this integral is going to be equal to um, our um, our f evaluated at that point c, which is on a, b, um, times our upper bound minus our lower bound. Um, and that's, that's, a, uh, that's a theorem that you learn about in calculus one. That's called the mean value theorem for integrals. So we're going to apply that to our case. So that says that there exists a c1, because we've already used c, that exists on this interval um, from, uh, hold on, up here, b of t to b of t plus h, such that our f at c1 comma t plus h, don't forget, our function of x is really a function of x and t, but we're kind of you know, we're, we're kind of calling that just a function of, of x, where our t is an arbitrary constant. Um, so it is still a function of x. All right. But there exists a c1 on this interval that is incredibly small, such that this integral is going to equal f at c1 comma t plus h times our um, the difference of our bounds. All right. So this... Applying this to our case gives this. All right. And don't forget, as h goes to 0, c1 goes to bt, b of t, I'm sorry. Because, don't forget, this interval is, in, is going to be incredibly small as h goes to 0. In fact, it's going to be crammed... Uh, in between two things that are infinitesimally separated. Um, so it's just going to go to b of t. So we can replace this f of c1 comma t plus h with just f of b of t comma t. Um, and don't forget that's as because this h goes to zero and our c1 is crammed in between this infinitely small interval which converges to just b of t. So this integral can be um, very, very closely um, approximated by f of b of t comma t times b of t plus h minus b of t. And of course, that's the limit as this goes to zero. Um, but we're not going to take that limit yet. We're just understanding that this limit is, is is going to be going to zero eventually. We're going to leave this h alone for now. Okay, and then basically I state the exact same thing except with our other integral up here. It's, it's just the exact same thing, just, just having to do with this part. All right. 
So we can substitute these approximations back into our expression. Uh, so I just replaced the uh, integrals with this um, derived expression right here using the mean value formula or mean value theorem for integrals. And then don't forget we still have this divided by h and we are taking the limit as h goes to zero. Okay. So now we take the limits. Don't forget this uh, this f of b of t comma t does not depend on h. So we can technically bring it outside the in, the limit and then just take this limit, which is right here, and this limit, which is right here. And these are exactly the limit definitions of uh, b prime of t and a prime of t. So finally, we can rewrite f prime of t as b or, or as f of b of t comma t times b prime of t minus f of a of t comma t times a prime of t plus the integral from a of t to b of t of the partial with respect to t of our function of f of x and t. All right. So there we go. Now we've derived the general, I, I should have put general Leibniz rule for differentiation under the integral sign. I just wrote the Leibniz rule. Um, the Leibniz rule that we've been using, like I said, it just, it involves constant bounds of integration, which by the way comes from this. Think about it. If our A and T were uh, constants, then our B prime of T and our A prime of T would go to zero. So this whole part would drop out and we'd be left with this familiar part right here. Um, so there we go. That's it. That's that's the proof of the uh, uh, Leibniz rule for differentiation under the integral sign. Now, um, a few notes um, about continent, continuity and differentiability. Uh, for the interchange of the limits and in integration and the application of the mean value theorem, we assume all this, that, that um, f of x and t and its partial derivative with respect to t are continuous in both variables x and t. All right, we're making that assumption. And that a and t and b and t are differentiable functions of t. So we have to have that. And the approximation using the mean value theorem becomes exact in the limit as h go, goes to zero since the interval length on b of t to b of t plus h and a of t and a of t plus h shrinks to zero. And that's it, guys. That is that is the uh, proof of the Leibniz rule for differentiation under the integral sign. I hope you enjoyed that and we will see you next time.